I'm going to listen to Morton Feldman's second string quartet all the way through without stopping. Okay, I'm going to hit play. If I don't stop, it's 4.30 now, it's going to be almost 11 p.m. by the time I'm done. I'm going to regret this, aren't I? In case you're wondering, I'm sitting in a hotel room in an undisclosed location in Switzerland. This entire operation is completely secret. Nobody knows I'm doing this. Nobody knows where I am. It's the only way to listen to this string quartet. You'll be interrupted otherwise. I don't think Feldman even listened to it all the way through. I think he just started writing and probably fell asleep at the premiere. He was known for that. So here's the ultimate comedy of this video. I'm hearing the piece, but you're not. You're just hearing me. Is anyone going to watch this? So I, I'm going to comment the piece a little bit as I go through it. I don't know if I'll have that much to say. I might just sit here in a kind of stupor. Or I might get really talkative. I don't know. We'll see. I have two glasses of water to get through this. Cheers. It is to do this video in one take, without any edits. I mean, otherwise, what's the point? I could condense this down into five minutes, but you wouldn't get the visceral idea of what it's like to actually listen to this thing. It's actually quite beautiful so far. So if you're wondering, this is the recording by the Flux Quartet which came out, I think, around 2000 or thereabouts. Nice recording. Not that there's that many to choose from with this piece. I wonder why. Ah, that's beautiful. <laughs> you don't know what it is because you can't hear it. It's this passage in harmonics. Really nice. So Feldman talks about how, when he was writing this piece, it sort of came out of a 
strange kind of midlife crisis that he had where he woke up one morning and realized that he didn't know what art was. And he didn't know if music was an art. Is music an art form? He wasn't sure. If it's an art form, then what can you do? Kind of a strange, strange thought to have had. I think what he means by it is, is music always beholden to some other utilitarian purpose of some kind? Can it actually be a totally autonomous medium of exploration in the same sense that the visual arts can? So then he wrote this. I guess the idea was he was completely giving up any notion of practicality or any thought really to the uh, performability of what he was doing, any thought to the experience of listening to it for that matter, or of playing it. Would it even be possible to play it in a concert? I don't think he knew or cared really. Just trying to see how far he can push this art form. It's a chord here that's the same as the opening of the ninth Klavierstück from Stockhausen. That's kind of funny. I wonder if that was intentional. Hope I don't fall asleep. This that would really be embarrassing. Hey, you know what you can do? If you're like completely bored already of watching me sit here doing nothing, you can watch the video at double speed on YouTube. I do that sometimes. That way it would only be sick <laughs> only be three hours long. Nobody's watching at this point anyway. You've probably all gone off to greener pastures. I should probably be rationing this water. Oh well. God, why would somebody do this? I'm referring to Feldman, not myself, although that's also open to question. possible I might enjoy this experience. I'm an open-minded person. It's nice. It's beautiful, undeniably.
Definitely beautiful. You know, what's interesting about this piece is you kind of grasp right away that you're in for the long haul, the, the long haul, that this is going to take a while. The piece announces its temporality right away, you know, within the opening minute or so. It's interesting that, isn't it? You just know it's not going to be over in half an hour or an hour or two hours. It's going to be a long piece. My wife has pointed out that I'm a bit fidgety. I've never tried to do anything like this. I've been through Wagner operas, but this is longer. At least in the Wagner opera, there's intermissions. I actually don't know if I can do this. We'll see, I guess. You know, what's kind of hilarious is that actually I have a camera that has a six hour uh, recording limit. <laughs> That's going to be useful. That's exactly the amount of time I think this video is going to last. I, I don't know if this is actually going to work technically. I don't know if the camera is going to overheat or something or will run out of memory, although I've got a one terabyte card in there. and. Theoretically, I can do six hours of recording. Hope so. God, it'd be annoying if I had to do this again. Okay, so far this is actually not unpleasant. It's a nice piece. It's really beautiful. I'll bet you most people though that get the recording, if they ever listen to it, they'll listen to it in small sections and 
you know, maybe a, a CD here and there, and they'll listen to it over the course of a week or in a kind of semi-distracted way over the course of a day, but it'd be interesting to see what it's like to actually hear the whole thing. So the Flux Quartet recording of this helpfully uh, has individual tracks with uh, titles that refer to the page number that of the score that we're on. So according to this, we're now at about page seven out of, um, oh God, 124 pages, okay. So. Okay. Imagine how funny it would be if it turned out I had forgotten to press record. I'd really find that hilarious. <laughs> the joke would really be on me. Oh, that is really beautiful. I mean, it's repetitive. There, there are lots of repeat signs in the score, apparently, although I've never actually seen a physical copy of the score, but there's a lot of repetition in Schubert. Listen to the first two Schubert symphonies. I love them, actually. I love number three, too. Uh, but they're really, I mean, they're really repetitive. They're incredibly repetitive. Stravinsky said that uh, only Schubert could write a melody so beautiful that he could bear its unvaried repetition. I would concur with Stravinsky. The themes in Schubert are remarkably beautiful. Listen to um, the Trout Quintet. The exposition of the first movement, he plays the, th the theme straight through three times. Three times, that's enough, you know. Does it need to be three times? I don't know, it's so beautiful though. You don't mind. Sort of like being in paradise. And this isn't so bad either, I have to say. God, I feel like one of those idiots who talks all the way through a movie, you know? kind of torn between wanting to make this potentially entertaining to watch and wanting to just shut up and listen to the music. I don't know if I, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to find a restaurant that's open at this hour, like when I, by the time I'm done listening to this piece, so I'm actually going to be able to go out and get anything to eat. I certainly hope so. Should have thought of that before. I should have gotten some bananas at the train station. 
can't think of everything. God, it's beautiful. It's crazy. It's crazily beautiful. Can he do this for six hours? Can he keep this up? Maybe he can. Nobody else could have written this piece. That's something to aspire to as a composer, you know, write the pieces that nobody else can write. Only you can write them. Everybody has that, I think, in them. Most people don't do it though. It's too hard. You write the piece that you think other people want you to write, and then, <laughs> then they don't listen to it. It's insanely beautiful. It's insanely beautiful. God, this is a good piece. God, it's good. I'm repeating myself, but that's what I think. What if we just sacrificed ourselves for the pursuit of beauty, nothing else, just that. Not a thought to any other contingencies. Just slavish devotion to beauty. Would we all do this? Composers aspire to lots of things. Beauty isn't always one of them. It can be. A lot of composers aspire to be interesting or original. They aspire to do a good job. They aspire to fulfill the terms of their commissions. They aspire to be innovative. Very rarely they aspire to be funny. They aspire to be intelligent, good craftsmen. What if you just tried to write the most beautiful piece you could, period?
Is this musical analysis what I'm doing? I don't think so. I don't think this is an analysis video. I'm kind of known for making analysis videos, but... You know what? I'm a free agent. I'm an independent artist. And I can do stuff like this. I don't know if this is going to be interesting, but... It's good to be independent. There's this little cluster of four adjacent semitones that keeps returning in different disguises, disguises, different guises throughout this piece. It's like, it's not very promising material. Four adjacent semitones, the fragment of the chromatic scale. But that's what, you know, that's what really amazing artists do. They take the most unpromising material and they can do something with it because they're transfiguring it. It's a kind of alchemy. He must have been in some kind of interesting state, you know, when he wrote this, because it's a kind of cascade of one beautiful idea after another, and it just doesn't quit. Uh, it's amazing. I mean, how do you sustain that? Okay, well, there are no smartphones then. There's no internet when he wrote this.
I mean, I like Twitter and all that, but God. Probably makes us dumber, doesn't it? TikTok. Destroying the ability to focus. That's pretty bad. You know what's interesting listening to this piece is how how important pitch is in it. You know, it's always got the right pitch, pitch and timbre. Never, never writes the wrong note. It's true of Mozart. It's true of Schubert. It's true here. There are no wrong notes. You could say, well, that's easy. It's an atonal piece. Well, no, it's not easy. It's not easy at all. Atonal doesn't mean all of your criteria for quality go out the window. He's just not going to stop, is he? If you're wondering how I'm doing this, it's actually just a continuous playlist 
in uh, iTunes. Don't even have to change CDs or anything. So this is, I think, coming as close as possible to a completely unmediated experience of the piece. You know, if, if you were to listen to this in a concert hall, you'd be for sure distracted by people coming and going because from what I've heard at live performances of this piece, the audience is encouraged to wander around, take breaks, go outside, come back, go have dinner, come back, the piece is still going. They're like, you, know, you really don't have to sit here this whole time, just come and stay for 15 minutes, five minutes if you want. If you get bored, just leave. It could be really hard to, like the, the true experience of this piece is a, an inner experience, I think. It's something that lives in your mind after you've heard it, maybe even before you've heard it, sort of like a conceptual artwork. The thing about conceptual artworks is you don't have to experience them. You can just read the log line, so to speak, the little bit of ad copy that explains in one sentence what it's all about. This is different though, you have to experience this. It's really something. I guess this is my third sip of water. I wonder what my viewer retention is going to be on this video. I'm guessing not everyone's going to sit and watch it all the way through. That's an educated guess. I have some YouTube shorts that are 30 seconds long that people don't watch all the way through. They get to like 28 seconds in and they're like, okay, that's enough. Yeah. Hilarious.
It's still beautiful. Well, you can't say I'm not committed to your entertainment making videos like this. I wonder if this is the dumbest thing I've ever done. Probably not. I'm getting a private playback now of some of the dumbest things I've done. Yeah, no, this is not, this is not uh, in the top 10, unfortunately. What this must must be like for the performers, I really, I really can't fathom.
I'm not asleep, I'm just kind of into it. Remember kids, if I can do this, anyone can. I don't have any special abilities. I'm just sitting and listening. I wonder if this is the most boring video that's ever been put on YouTube. Lassie, it's so repetitive, but it's not boring somehow. I'm, I'm not bored at all.
so I'm just about at an hour in. Let me check the time on the camera. 53 minutes. Already 53 minutes. God, that's a that's a long string quartet. But you can tell he's just getting started. He's just getting warmed up. It's weird how you know even at this point in the piece, it's you can tell this is this is really just going to keep going. So beautiful. He had that thing Stravinsky had, you know, just a kind of genius for chord voicings and instrumentation. I mean, you can learn that to an extent, but it, it seems to be quite rare you know, to find this absolute sense of rightness about how do you lay out the notes in a chord. It's instinctively right with Feldman. That's right. I'm looking at you. I'm looking at you while I listen to these sounds that you can't hear. It's like pure solipsism, but kind of suits me. Nice. So who, who is the you that is watching this video? Who might be hearing me say this? I don't know. If you're watching it, you're... Uh, by necessity in the future relative to me right now. So hello to the future. I hope the future is grand. I hope you're having a good time. I hope the future is an unending series of improvements over the past. Could be. I always wonder if we're going to manage to travel to interstellar space one day. A lot of people say it's impossible. I don't think it's impossible. I think it's likely. I think we'll get to interstellar space. I think technology is advancing at such an insane pace that we literally can't imagine what's around the corner. I mean, I'm not planning on going personally. But I hope 
hope that that lies in our future. Yeah, Feldman sometimes has this pan-diatonic thing happening where he uses all the tones in a major scale. Stravinsky was fond of that. Check out the opening chord of the Violin Concerto in D by Stravinsky. I think it's got seven notes if you count everything that's happening in the orchestra and in the solo part. Seven note chord. All the all the diatonic tones of a D major scale works really well. Amazing chord. Feldman oscillates between these diatonic things, which never quite sound tonal or diatonic, and then these chromatic fragments. There's that uh, beautiful motif again. Si do mi fa do sol re la. Ah, that's so beautiful. The eight notes. I'm immediately thinking, what are the missing tones? If he's using eight, eight semitones, what's the what's the chromatic complement? Does that occur later on in the piece? I see. This is how composers think. Or at least I do. That's how I work anyway. I love to work with <clears throat> chromatic sets like that. Complementary hexachords. Anybody? Love that. Except I don't usually work with chromatic complementary hexachords. I usually work with seven plus five. It's uh, actually just kind of evolved that way in my work. I've been kind of working that way for a few years now. Seven tones plus the missing five tones. It's not, I don't write serial music. It's not serial music, but I like to work with these limited groups of tones. create negative spaces, the tones that you hear for a while, and then the missing ones. Flip back and forth between them, or have them at the same time. You can do quite a lot with that. But Feldman always said he didn't have a system. And he was really strident about it. I don't have a system, you know. I just write the notes that I need to write, the right note at the right time, kind of thing. He had a system, actually. There are, <laughs> at least if he didn't have a system, he, he definitely had techniques that can be described formally. It's not just as though he's making it all up as he goes along. There's a logic to it, or at least a consistency to it. Maybe logic is the wrong word. He always said during his lifetime that he and Boulez couldn't both be right. Listening to this piece, I'm now... Okay, I just passed the one hour mark. Yeah, I mean, he's not wrong, right? Listening to this piece, it's, it's pretty convincing. He doesn't sound wrong. I like Boulez too, though. But yeah, this is good. This is a good piece. Seriously good piece.
God, it's so good. He keeps coming up with things that are surprising in this piece. It's like, it's a limited vocabulary in many respects, but... God, that is good, this chromatic thing. Fantastic. Just fantastic. He makes it so you just want to keep on listening because it's so interesting. It's so beautiful. Amazing. This piece has an interesting uh, quality of being tragic because it's so beautiful. But you know it's not going to go on forever, no matter how long it is. Okay, so that's page 25 starting now. Page 25 out of 100, 124. Yeah, so a fifth of the way through. It's not that impressive, right? It's not like I'm running a marathon or something. But I, I feel like, you know, I'm accomplishing something here. How is it that the Flux Quartet knows exactly how to play this piece? They've really nailed it. Just great. I wonder if I'll ever get to meet them. This is really impressive. It's not, it's not often that you feel bowled over with admiration, you know, for what an, art, an artist has managed to do. This is really impressive. Impressive that our culture could produce this. I was gonna reach for some water, but I have to ration it. Wait another 20 minutes. <laughs> Actually, since the score contains multiple repeat signs, uh, there's some degree of variability in terms of the duration of a performance. Uh, some quartets don't actually observe all the repeats. 
makes it considerably shorter. I'm not actually sure if the Flux Quartet did all the repeats. I mean, I could sit here reading the score as I listen, but I mean, I don't see any point. Glenn Gould didn't do any of the repeats in the Goldberg variations the second time he recorded it, except, I believe, in the canonic variations, if memory serves me. But his second recording is still quite a lot longer than the first. See, I'm a fountain of knowledge. Omitting repeats doesn't always result in a more compact performance.
I have a sneaking suspicion this piece is more or less in A major. <laughs> Could be. The more likely explanation is that he uses open strings a lot, and uh, all the instruments of a string quartet have an A string. The pitch A is predominating, actually, in this piece. Lots of C-sharps, too. You can do nice harmonics on... Nice C-sharp natural harmonics on string instruments. Uh, except the double bass. Double bass is not fantastic at C-sharp harmonics. Wait a minute. What am I saying? Of course, double basses can do that on their third string. Guess I'm getting tired. See, I can't edit that part out. This is the whole point, isn't it? The unvarnished experience. Not too early to get some water. See, I'm just an instinctive thing. These pizzicato things. <laughs> it's completely crazy. God, it's so good. Suddenly it's like, this could be a scherzo in a Bartok string quartet or something, but it's still Feldman. What's interesting is this piece could be way less good than it is, you know? It's like five and a half hour string quartet. That could be pretty dire, but it's way better than you have a right to expect it to be. It's a really good piece. You know, if you doubt Feldman, listen to this thing all the way through. I think you'll be convinced. So, um, it's not cheating if I stand up, you know, I'm still listening. I'm just gonna stand up for a second. 
still listening. I'm still here. See, there's my hand. Let's see. that glissando thing. See, there are materials that return in this piece. It's, um, it's a kind of a strange sort of memory form. Memorial form, right? These texture types, these figures return, keep recurring. But you might have heard them the last time, like, an hour ago, and you get into this space where time just doesn't really mean anything anymore when you're listening to this piece. It's, you feel like you're in a kind of eternal space. It could go on forever because there's no teleology to it. There's no, it's not inclining towards an ultimate resting point. It's very little music that you can where you can say that, you know? Most music is in a hurry to get somewhere. Final cadence, the final chorus, the coda. Keep moving forward in a straight line. Feldman's not in a hurry, <laughs> that's for sure. And he's not going anywhere. You're just in this kind of eternal space, floating. See, this is what it can be like if you don't have anywhere to be, anything to do. You're not in a uh, doing framework, you're in a being framework. This is a good vision, a good world view. I like it. I mean, I'm not a Buddhist or anything, but there's something to that. Maybe Feldman was on to something. Maybe. He used to make fun of composers who write these 20 minute pieces, you know, for chamber orchestra or for ensemble. Pierrot style pieces that last for 20 minutes. There's so many of those. <laughs> and there's an interview with him. I can't remember if there's a, a video or if it's something I read in a book, but he's talking with a, a composer, and maybe it's Elliot Carter. And he says, you know, you ever notice that the 20 minute piece has become the standard format? And the composer he's talking to says, yes, I suppose that's true. I, that is about my length. You know, most of my pieces are about 20 minutes. We're all guilty of writing 20-minute pieces. I've written a few 20-minute pieces. I don't know why that format became so widespread. 
interesting things happen when you dispense with it, when you dispense with the 20 minute format. Either go really short or vastly long. 20 minutes is a kind of common sense approach. It's like, it's not too much, but it's, a, it's enough. You know, you can say something, you can have a bit of an argument, like a dramaturgical argument in a piece that's 20 minutes. Probably not going to overstay your welcome unless, you know, you're really inept and the piece is a mess and it's boring. If you're reasonably skilled as a composer, you can pull off a 20 minute piece. Come on, anyone can do that. But can you pull off a five and a half hour piece? Probably not. You probably can't. Feldman could. He didn't get enough credit. There it is again. It's like an apparition. It's so simple, but you remember it every time it comes back. It's different every time. Different number of repeats. somehow holds the piece together. We're not just spiraling out into infinity. Uh, there are elements of recursion in this piece. I think that's part of the key to its success. So it's a shutter speed 1 50th of a second f 2.2 2, iso 125 if you were wondering and i'm shooting this on a 35 mill millimeter lens uh, f 1.4 sure you were wondering Nope, not yet.
do si la si do si la si there's that chromatic fragment again always in different configurations do si la si you can do a lot with that but then again you can do a lot with a triad mozart did quite a lot with a broken c major triad This is what I'm always telling my students, you don't need much to make a piece. In fact, you probably need to not have much to make a piece, otherwise it doesn't work. Feldman had this quip, you know, that the longer the piece, the less material you need. Don't exactly know what he means, but I, I kind of do know what he means. <laughs> He's one of the most quotable composers who ever lived. I mean, he, the man had a gift for words. He was very lively and funny, entertaining, brilliant. Uh, yeah, it's just a great piece just really admirative, I have to say. There's some Stravinsky and Bartok in this, definitely. Not much Webern. Feldman's often compared to Webern. Doesn't sound like Webern to me. Not even remotely. Yeah, he's closer to Stravinsky, isn't that interesting? And neoclassical Stravinsky, too. The Rake's Progress, Agon, Violin Concerto, Dumbarton Oaks, The Ebony Concerto. I think he really admired those pieces. Feldman gave a talk once at Darmstadt where he said, uh, if you don't have Stravinsky in your life, then you don't know instruments. And he meant neoclassical Stravinsky. It's like not the thing to say at Darmstadt, or at least not at that time. He was right, of course. Very few people have understood instruments as thoroughly as Stravinsky understood instruments. And I think Feldman's in that category too. It's a very, very uh, restrained number of composers that you can say that of, I think, where you know they really never put a foot wrong always the right note on the right instrument, the right register, the right dynamic level at the right time. Flawless.
See, this is the sort of thing you can only do in a hotel room. That's part of why I love hotel rooms. I'm reminded of the uh, French poet and novelist Raymond Roussel. Uh, I admired quite a lot and read quite a lot of when I was a teenager. I still actually really enjoy Roussel. He had the strange habit of... Uh, Roussel, if you don't know, was a, uh, a vastly wealthy uh, sort of Parisian esthete who inherited quite a lot of money and uh, spent it pursuing these insane projects, uh, writing these crazy novels and self-publishing them, and going on enormously expensive world tours and stuff like this. He had the habit of traveling to very exotic locations, getting these really fancy hotel rooms and not leaving the hotel. <laughs> he would mostly just stay in the hotel. And there's a story about the poet Jeremy Prynne, J.H. Prynne, who I actually just saw in Cambridge last week. Uh, he was composing a poem called Kazoo Dreamboats. And he flew to, I can't remember if it was Taiwan, uh, during a uh, semester break at the University of Cambridge. Went to somewhere like Taiwan, I don't know if it was actually Taiwan, for like two weeks. Got a hotel room, and uh, he lived off of coffee and ice cream for two weeks. Just sat in his hotel and wrote, just composed this long poem. And it was unlike anything he'd ever written. And I have this fantasy of like doing that, you know, getting in a hotel for two weeks. Nobody knows where I am, I'm just sitting and writing. And then whatever comes out of that, you know, that's the piece. It's hard to do that, though, you know. It's really hard to do that. You've got obligations and, well, who doesn't have obligations? Hey, maybe I could be the first person in history who doesn't have obligations. Forget it. Am I wearing the right outfit for this? Like, I don't know. I don't know how someone's supposed to dress when listening to a Feldman piece for six hours. I mean, I wonder how the performers dress. Like, they if you do a live performance of this piece. Are you sitting there on stage in a tuxedo or like a suit? I mean, can you do that for six hours? I guess you could. How's the audience dressed? I don't know. I don't really like this shirt, but whatever. I'm traveling, you know. A limited number of clothes. Whatever.
how long has it been? An hour and 41 minutes. Mm, okay, I'm not actually tired, it's okay. I'll tell you something that uh, I probably shouldn't admit to. I said at the beginning of this video that I was in an undisclosed location in Switzerland in a hotel. Well, I'm not gonna exactly give it away, but what if I gave you a little hint, just a tiny hint. I don't know. I don't know if I'll give you a hint. It's a really good hint. It's super interesting. Bit of trivia, actually, about where I am. I'm torn. It's like such a good piece of trivia, but it, there'd be someone out there who'd be able to determine where I was if I gave that hint. And maybe I won't. He knows just when to change the texture. It's like a perfect uh, sense of timing. Charles Ives had that too. That's it, part of the reason it never gets boring. It's uh, the timing is just perfect and he can sustain that hour after hour. It's amazing. Always with the same kind of, it's like two or three categories of motifs in this piece. It's like. It's really very little material. It's quite amazing. It's like arpeggiated figures, often in fourths, fifths, or thirds. Chromatic fragments, four note chromatic fragments. And um, 
these quasi diatonic things. There are pizzicato sections, sections that are entirely played in harmonics. And he's also fond of having one tone that's just held, like a drone, very softly, with other melodic tones around it. It's basically a accompanied melody type of texture, but very static. It would actually not be that hard to analyze this piece. It's probably been done, I'm sure. There's a few analyses of it. You know, if, if you were so inclined, you could do that. There are times in this piece where he's got all the string instruments um, in a very high register, either harmonics or just, you know, just really high pitches, and you have to have pretty sharp ears. It's hard to tell, actually, who's playing what at times, although after you've been listening for a while, you get a sense of where the instruments are located in the stereo field. But uh, once you get high enough, if you go really high on the viola's C string or the cello's, D string, play really softly, sul tasto, or with harmonics, artificial harmonics. It can be hard to tell who's playing what. And he plays on that ambiguity quite a lot. At times, the different instruments of the string quartet are clearly recognizable, identifiable, and contrasted with each other and characterized very strongly. And at other times, they just melt into this texture where you can't distinguish individual timbres at all. Highly fusional. It's just, a, it's a, you know what, it's a good piece on every level. Not just like, it, it's a good piece in the category of pieces that are insanely long. Uh, no, it's like, it's a good piece. It's You could compare this to a, a 20 minute piece and this piece would stand on its own merits, I think. It was definitely a composition. It's a unusual category of composition, and you listen to it in a very different way, but it's a composition. It's not like a... It's, I use the term uh, conceptual piece. It's not a conceptual piece. It's a, it's a composition. The Iliad and the Odyssey are acts of poetic composition. They're epics. This is a it's, a, it's an epic piece. That's all. Okay, time for some water, I think.
to your help. I'm on page 42 now. It's going by faster than I thought. Ha ha. We're one hour and 52 minutes. This is a really extended passage in harmonics. It occurs to me listening to this that there are actually very few moments in the piece where you do have the low register. Most of the time you're in quite a high register, or at least so far. Then again, we're only two hours in. Very sparing use of the low register. I'm kind of curious to hear how that evolves. He often uses the viola as a bass instrument rather than the cello. The cello will be playing something really high. He's got the viola on the bottom. Sounds really quite nice. And if you're doing a piece this long, you have to try out all kinds of different things like that. Got time after all.
I'm still really enjoying the piece, but I'm actually really curious to find out if I'm still convinced by it when it's over. If, you know. past two hours. Wow, that was fast. I feel like I'm five minutes in. It's really weird about this piece. You don't have any sense of trajectory or, you know, dramaturgy at all. It could have been five minutes and it could have been two hours. There's no difference. But I'm still into it. I'm still, you know, but you're in a kind of eternal present when you listen to this piece. There's no sense of past or future. Harmonic pizzicatos. It's on a D. Great. Really nice sound. Hard to play. Again and again. At a quiet dynamic level. Should I tell you the hint about the hotel? Well, uh, it's such an interesting bit of trivia. It's a really interesting hotel. Maybe later. If you find out where this hotel is, you might hop into your time machine go back in time and find me here, knock on the door. 
Wouldn't that be disconcerting for me? It would make an interesting video, though. I better not say anything, because that might, that might happen. You might get in your time machine and disturb me while I'm listening to the piece. Don't want to take any chances. The cello is harmonic, D pizzicato, still going. No, it just, it just stopped. <laughs> That's a long time. <laughs> long time to play that sound. Sensational, sensationally beautiful. It's really good. Oh, bravo, Morty. You really did the work, didn't you? Love when he goes all pizzicato on us like that. Now we're on page 47 now. Okay. In case anybody's listening along, synchronizing to this video, which I highly doubt. It's an interesting texture with these uh, crescendos and decrescendos on a held note. It's kind of, it's very Ruth Crawford Seeger of him. Ruth Crawford Seeger's String Quartet, 1931. Great piece. The slow movement in that is a dynamics canon, where the, you have these changes of dynamics on tel tones, and then they are imitated in the different instruments of the quartet. Remarkable piece. There's some of Feldman in or rather, there's some of Ruth Crawford Seeger in this piece.
Sensationally beautiful. He lets you just hear the st his string instruments, and the thing is, who hasn't just listened to someone bowing on the open strings of a violin? You know, just hearing the sound of the instrument itself, it's just, it's such a beautiful sound. It reminds me of Barnett Newman. Barnett Newman would make these wall-sized paintings you know, with just huge flat areas of color, red, uh, standing right next to a little thin yellow stripe, these primary colors in stark contrast with one another. And the, I think it was Donald Judd who said, uh, when Barnett Newman paints a big area of red, it's like the red is as good as the paint that comes out of the tube. It's like you can really appreciate the magnificence of the color of the, the raw material that he's using. It's like that to some degree with Feldman too. You can appreciate the, you're really listening to string instruments and just how beautiful they are, how beautiful the timbre is. Without him really even needing to do all that much, it's just like a still life. Here's a violin, here's what a violin sounds like. Maybe that's enough. It's still riveting, it's still such a good piece. The rate of change is inconstant in this piece, it keeps, keeps changing. Times where he spends a really long time on one fragment, one texture type, and other times where it moves pretty quickly. I'm, uh, what, uh, two hours, uh, two hours, 12 minutes in. The pace of change is getting a bit faster. Interesting. I would have thought the opposite. I wonder what the last half hour of the piece is going to be like, if it's any different. It's so interesting now this isn't boring. I mean, I'm not uh, not talking about the video. The video is probably incredibly boring. The, the piece is not boring. In fact, I, I doubt if anyone's watching the video at this point. I'm probably just talking into the void. Mm, that's all right. It's like the Hippocratic Oath, first do no harm. I don't know about the quality of this video, but at least I'm doing no harm.
in a kind of polka tooth type of texture here. The instrument's playing individual tones and sort of creating a, a line out of these individual sounds as they're braided together. And there's room for everything in a piece like this. This experience is making me really want to have a room like this to work in. You know, my office is kind of small, it's kind of cramped. I'm not complaining, but it's, it is kind of small and it's got a lot of stuff in it. You know, it's a small room and it's got a piano and desk, printers, camera equipment, many books, many scores, CDs, uh, all my files. A lot of things. Uh, this is a fairly large room and there's nothing in it. Wall-to-wall -wall carpeting, it absorbs the sound very nicely. It's kind of, you can block out the light. Although there is plenty of natural light if so desired. I would really like to have a room like this to work in. Hint, hint, if there's anybody out there who can make that happen. I wonder what that would do to my writing. There's a, you can't see it, but there's a table that runs all the way along the wall in front of me. It's about three or four meters long, four meters at least, maybe five meters actually. I'm not very good at spatial estimates. I would gather it's, yeah, more like five meters. Anyway, a long continuous desk. It's deep enough that you could have some pretty large score pages there. I'd like to have a huge desk like that. Just settle in, no distractions. A room like this would be really good to do some writing. It would probably make me a better composer, actually. I'm cogitating on that as I listen to this piece. It's a really good piece, it's stimulating my mind. Now he brings in the harmonic A pizzicato. We had the D previously. And these sorts of things. When you're a composer, you notice these things and they contribute to the uh, coherence of the overall piece, the design of the piece. I know that sound, that cello, harmonic A. I write a lot for string instruments and I, I think I know them pretty well. You recognize these sounds. We all have our favorite sounds, you know. I certainly have mine.
page 52 now. Page 52 is nice. Almost 7 p.m. Not even halfway through. He's got this pizzicato motif, A, D, and G on the cello's top three strings, very slow. It's worth remembering that classical concertos, those Vivaldi concertos, you know, uh, they're usually in D major, violin concertos. Why? You have lots of open strings. Sounds really resonant. The violin sounds great in D major. Cello too, for that matter. Viola concertos, nobody cares what key those are in. Come on. Who cares? Violin and cello concertos should be in D. So how was your day, Sam? Well, well, I got up at 6 in the morning. Was at my desk teaching by 6.30. Made breakfast for my family. Went on a five-hour train journey to Switzerland. Got to the hotel. Spent six hours listening to Morton Feldman. And then hopefully had some dinner afterwards. Six hours is long, but it's not that long. How many times do you spend 
six hours just doing nothing mindlessly, not thinking about how you're using your time, not aware of the preciousness of your time, just sort of squandering it. Six hours is not that long. And it's six hours well spent. And you know, six hours, the piece isn't even six hours. It's more like five hours, 35 minutes. Not that big of a deal. There's plenty of time to do other things in a day that you listen to a piece like this. If you're wondering, if you're thinking, maybe I'd like to listen to this piece too, you just schedule it. That's what I did. Just schedule it in, sit and listen. Still gives you lots of time to do other things. You can go for a jog. Repair your bicycle. Spend time with your loved ones. Write some music. Do a bit of work. Drink some lemonade. What do people do with their time? Marcel Duchamp said, my capital is time, not money. So we seem to be in a kind of quasi slow movement of the piece at this point. The pace of change has slowed down considerably. Not much is happening at this point. The uh, materials are getting repeated quite a lot more. See, this is a kind of real-time phenomenal, phenomenological analysis that I'm doing. I'm just sort of describing my own stupid thoughts and my 
real-time observations of the piece. Probably the worst type of analysis there is, but that's what you're stuck with if you're watching this. So there's a motif that I last heard, I think, about an hour ago. This is the beginning of page 58, uh, 55, page 55. pitches. It's really haunting, that little motif. This is music for listening to late at night. It's got a very much a nocturnal quality. Feldman didn't write music for the day, did he? It's always three o'clock in the morning in Feldman's world. Uh, part of me wants to say, you know, I think you need to be able to write music for different times of the day. You know, you don't just write Vespers. But he always wrote 3 o'clock a.m. music. That was his thing. You know, a lot of my stuff is evening music, but I can, I can write a good 2 o'clock p.m. piece or a good... 9 a.m. piece or a good 6 a.m. piece. I'm not boasting, but I think it's true. You know. Samuel, would you write a piece that would be, you know, it would sound really appropriate at 5 p.m. or 5.30 p.m.? Sure. I think, it, you know, you need to be able to do that, but, uh, well, Feldman was the master of the 3 a.m. piece. For what it's worth.
by this point in the piece, there's starting to be more of a sense of accumulation, I would say, of uh, materials returning again and again. You start to recognize them, you start to understand a little bit more the dynamics of these different textures and motifs. The, the piece seems to have something like a very, very long expository section in which Feldman very slowly, like the first hour of the piece, sort of lays out these different materials. And after about the first hour, then there's a lot of recombination going on. Not a huge amount of new material, although there is some. You start noticing more, oh, I've heard that before. There's that gorgeous and very disconcerting, chromatic, really dissonant. It sounds sort of like a, it, oh, it's gone again. Someone should do a Shankurian analysis of this piece. Ha <laughs> ha. Some stupid academic probably already has. I wonder if this counts as fasting, because I'm actually starting to get a bit hungry. I haven't eaten anything since 12.30 and it's... I don't even want to know how late it is now. Two hours, 40 minutes. Okay. That means I'm just about at the halfway point, almost.
so far the whole piece has just been really soft and quiet, like pianissimo throughout. And many uh, performers have told me, you know, people who play at Feldman, that one of the hardest things about these pieces is not so much just the extreme duration, but the physical control necessary to play these really soft sounds for such a long span of time. Very, very physically challenging. I'm starting to get a sense of that. It's like, doesn't he want to have a loud sound just from time to time? Well, it's still relatively early going. It still might happen. He developed this curiosity about the future when you listen to this piece. What's going to happen next? It's so spacious, it's wonderful. You can just... You have a feeling like there's no... There's no limitation, you know? You can just take as much time as you want. Heavenly, really. When do I ever get to do that in life? My schedule is, you know, an hour of this, an hour of this, 45 minutes of this, an hour and a half of this, two hours of this. It's like the horizon is usually pretty short. This is wonderful. And I thought my video about Feldman's bass clarinet percussion was too long. <laughs> it's important to feel free in life, you know, or at least to have pockets of freedom, genuine freedom. There's a Tom Rayworth poem I set to music, Come Back, Come Back, O Glittering in White, which is, I think Tom told me once, it was a quotation from another poet, I can't remember who. Come back, come back, O glittering in white. White being, what, freedom? Hope? Freedom. Having the freedom to do insane things like this. Should be normal. Should not be insane. I'd be in favor of a slower culture, slowing down. Think about how long it took to build Chartres Cathedral. You think, well, you could probably find a few hours to listen to a Feldman piece.
Feldman gets into these respiratory rhythms in some of his late pieces, the piano and string quartet pieces like that too, and one that was recorded by the Kronos Quartet in Aki Takahashi. The rhythms are sort of long, short, long, short, sort of breathing rhythm, very regular, very steady. It's quite hypnotic. Music is an embodied phenomenon and melody and rhythm are analogous to breath and the feet, walking, dancing, running, that's where our rhythms come from, and the breath, the heartbeat, these things are fundamental to music, universal I would say. You can't get too far from that. Composers are in trouble, I think, if they don't relate physically to what they're doing. should be done this glass of water because we're about halfway through I've got two glasses of water to drink I see this glass is empty now You seen that scene in Dick Tracy where, you know, the Warren Beatty movie where Dick Tracy is interrogating uh, Mumbles? That comes to mind.
That was another one of those Bartok-esque pizzicato passages. I never noticed before how much some of this music sounds like Bartok. That's actually quite interesting. Not a composer you associate with Feldman so much. It's just, okay, so this, this piece obviously has a motivic instruction. I mean, the a little four note cell recurs again and again and again in so many different shapes. That's why I said earlier, you know, it would really be quite easy to analyze if you wanted to. And these descending sevenths, na da da da, ma da ba da, that's another recurring motif. There's, there's not that many of them.
pitches are starting to get a little bit blurry, which is maybe a sign that I've been listening to this piece for a long time. I have a pretty acute sense of pitch, but it's getting difficult. It's still 3 o'clock a.m. in this piece, you know, it's like dawn never arrives in Feldman's world. Think of all the great sunrises and sunsets in the history of music. Wagner, Schoenbeck, not Feldman, it's always the middle of the night. Another manifestation of that four note motif here, it's really widely spaced. It's four chromatic pitches. It's 
the same thing that comes up also in the clarinet and string quartet piece, uh, of which there's a beautiful recording by Carol Robinson um, on Mode Records. Same kind of materials fundamentally. I think the last few years of his life, Feldman was basically just working with that. You know, maybe that's what happens to composers when they're older. They just want one chord. They only need one. You know. That's what happened with Boulez too. All those pieces where he just endlessly recycles that Zacher hexachord. And in this piece, in a lot of the late Feldman pieces, his chord is that little chromatic set. I wonder what mine will be when I only have one chord left. Maybe I don't want to know. Start the second glass. This quartet has themes, not just motifs. A good student will know the difference between a theme and a motif and a cell.
I've been to 17 countries, but not Portugal. This is really beautiful. I'm uh, three hours, 15 minutes in. It's really, it's getting good. Really hypnotic. He's sort of hitting his stride. It's interesting to think of a piece like this as a kind of performance in its own right. I think that's how Feldman thought about it. And he would sit down to write it was a performance. You know, what, what does that imply? The idea that composition might be a performance. It implies that it's unrepeatable. It's a unique moment, a unique moment of concentration that he brings to bear upon the work. It implies that he would start writing and just keep writing. And there would not necessarily be a great deal of revision, second guessing, just a kind of total focus. I can understand why he would he would have wanted to stay with the 3 a.m. piece, you know. He could handle it. And it could it could fit into his life. It could fit into his lifestyle. The way he wanted to live, the way he wanted to write, the way he wanted to work fundamentally. I get that. I think we're all born with a certain appetite for work. It's different in different people. My own appetite for work is devouring. It's, it's ceaseless. I like to work all the time. I've always been like that. But I recognize it's not that way for everybody. Feldman seems to have been someone who enjoyed getting up and just getting to work every day. People call it a work ethic, but it's not a work ethic. You're compelled to do it. It's an existential debt that you have. Paying off the debt of your existence through work. That's what allows me to be here in Switzerland and listen to this piece and maybe talk to you, maybe you're listening.
the harmonic A on the cello, pizzicato, returning again. Bum. It's clear as a bell. Yeah, he's moving through these materials I've heard before. Moments in the piece where there's something new emerging seem to be getting farther between. You know, it's okay to be tired and hungry, I say to myself. We have a horror of being tired and hungry. I don't mind it that much. There's worse things. Being tired and hungry simply means you have something to look forward to. There's a bed over there. I'm going to get to go into it tonight. That'll be nice. Oh, that's lovely. It's that pendiatonic thing. It's such a beautiful contrast when he brings that in. Mi fa la si. All in harmonics. Actually, no, wait, it's not all in harmonics. It can't possibly be. It's too low for that. Soltasto. Really soft. It's so beautiful. Just alternating something more diatonic with something chromatic, even if most of the piece is really chromatic. Incredibly effective. I'll have to remember that. He's paying attention. I, I, was, I was wrong. I said at the beginning that Feldman wasn't thinking about the experience of listening to the piece or the contingencies of performance. I think I was wrong. I th he's, he is thinking about the listener. There are principles of contrast and large-scale patterning that are very effective. These are like the world's most comfortable headphones, by the way, if you're looking to get some biodynamic. Very good.
Come on, Morty, aren't you tempted to make it a little bit louder? It's funny, just as I said that, there's a loud chord. See, his timing is perfect. He knows what I want before I even know it. Most impressive. I wonder if I'm the first person who's ever done this, actually, you know, made a playlist and just played the whole thing straight through without stopping. Could be.
There's that la re sol motif on the cello. But he had it on the open strings last time, and this time it returns in uh, pizzicato harmonics, which is, a, again, a, a sort of textural motif in this piece. You could do an analysis of the different texture types that Feldman explores in this work. There'd be many avenues, actually, for analysis. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to analyze the piece, but... I think partly because I enjoy listening to it so much. It's constant variation and permutation of the same elements. Very effective. Maybe it's the only way you could make a piece of this duration. I don't know. It does work. I've seen a few score pages from this piece, and one of the things that's remarkable about it, and it has this in common with many of the later Feldman pieces, he wrote the page pages out in a grid. Right, The, the bar lines are completely regular on the page. There's X number of bars per system and X number of systems per page, and it never changes throughout the entire 124 pages of the piece. He was approaching his work almost as though he were a visual artist, thinking about the design that it makes on the page, filling these big pages, you know, like he's making a drawing. He was onto something with that. And working to a grid also gives you a sense of continuity in the work, a sense of a grid to be filled with something. I would think that would actually be quite fun. He must have gotten that from Cage. Cage did that also in his some of his earlier pieces. You lay out the score page first and then you write the notes. Totally foreign to my way of working though. I'm too fond of measure changes. And again, Feldman's music has constant meter changes, but they always occupy the same amount of space. Doesn't matter if the bar is 316 or 24 or 22 or 21, it's always got the same amount of horizontal space on the page, which results in some very odd things. The spacing in these scores actually doesn't make sense in a kind of traditional music engraving, note spacing sort of way. And he often forces asynchronous meters in the four different parts to line up, which they would not normally do. So for example, there are passages where he'll have the first violin playing in 7-8, and the second violin is playing in 3-4, and the viola is playing in 3-16, and cello is playing in 2-2 two, two or whatever, in all these different meters but they line up visually. They all coincide. They all start and end at the same time. And then he'll start rotating through these different cycles of measures in each part. So if you actually count on a long enough time frame, it does add up. You get the same number of beats in each part, but the bar lines are forced to coincide vertically, which is odd. There's a lot of interesting uh, interpretational challenges that go along with this music, things that you would have to actually, you'd have to have a perspective, an opinion on how best to approach these notational enigmas that he creates. One of my favorite things in Feldman is the piece Piano and Orchestra. When he was living at the DAAD, he had this DAAD uh, fellowship in Berlin and uh, just wrote piece after piece, all of these amazing orchestra pieces, including uh, flute and orchestra, oboe and orchestra, piano and orchestra, a whole series of these. I think there's a cello one too, cello and orchestra. Um, and a beautiful CD of those pieces conducted by Hans Zender. Anyway, in piano and orchestra, <laughs> it's so perverse, but he starts off with, I think it's two violas playing, one of them is playing in F and the other is playing in E sharp at the same time in unison. 
well, not exactly in unison. He's not just being willfully perverse. There's actually an intention behind these notations, if only a negative intention, if only to shake you out of your habits as a performer. And there's lots of that in this quartet as well. And he does create a rhythmic sensation that is utterly his. It is really quite unique. And it's very impressive. You know, notation is so important. Notation implies a world. A, a great composer will have a typically a, a highly personal use of notation. You see that in Stravinsky, Ferdinand Hope, Zanakis, Webern, Feldman, Varez, Dufour, Grisé, you know. Lovely. So I want to see how I'm doing here with this piece. What track am I on? Page 80.
I really know an unusually broad range of very interesting people. That's something I'm very grateful for. I get to see interesting people all the time, which doesn't make it any any more remarkable. You don't get used to it. You don't become blasé about the presence of remarkable people, great people. And the thing is, it's really interesting to interact with them, but you can also get a very good sense of it just by reading their words or listening to their music or looking at their paintings or whatever it is. There have been some truly great people I've met had the privilege of spending some time with and finding that there's nothing to say. I already knew them through their work. You know, what are you going to do? Make small talk. Ask them all your dumb questions. The encounter with the human being is sometimes phenomenally interesting, and sometimes not. The work exists in a kind of separate category, in a sense. It's distinct from the person, even though it emerges from them. And sometimes what people make is more interesting than the people themselves. You can be at a dinner with someone whose work you deeply admire and be, you know, a little bit bored. It's funny. And never have that experience with the work. So just if you're wondering, I'm still really enjoying this piece. I'm happy to keep listening. It's, it's not, it's, this is not a hardship, not at all. It's not like I can't wait for this to be over. It's really enjoying this piece.
page 84. Some beautifully voiced cluster chords. Not quite clusters, but definitely very chromatic. It's very slow now.
There's that descending seventh again. It's like, uh, these motifs become sort of like old friends after a while. You've been listening to a piece for, that's uh, just about four hours now. Na tom, bom, bom. He, he likes to repeat things in groups of two. Ba bom, 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 and then a pause, and then does it again. You know, he's got his, he's got his ticks for sure, his compositional ticks, you know, everybody does. I mean, you can't write a piece if you don't have some favorite sounds. But a lot of, a lot of it relates to these breathing rhythms in Feldman. It's very much embodied music. It's not, it's not really abstract. It's not as esoteric as it's often described as. Pizzicato cello solo, that was surprising. Didn't imagine that. There haven't been any real solos up to this point. And there's the return of the La Re Sol. La Re Sol pizzicato motif. At this point, it's becoming like a combinatorial approach almost. Most of these sounds I've heard before, we're four hours into it now. Yeah, exactly. Exactly four hours and three seconds. There was one extended section about 20 minutes ago, I'm guessing. <laughs> Such a strange time scale, where there were just these very dissonant long held chords, that seems to be done with. Now we're getting back to some more familiar materials. It's a beautiful design of a piece. It's, it's like making a gigantic quilt, really, or a Turkish rug. He was very fond of those. Actually, the, the box set from uh, mode records of the Flux Quartet playing this entire piece, which if you're watching this video, if you're insane enough to still be watching, you should definitely order it because it's amazing. It's a, it's a great achievement, I think. Uh, very well recorded, very well played, of course, and uh, nicely designed. Anyway, the box has uh, images of uh, Turkish rugs. Feldman was known for being uh, very preoccupied with rugs. He collected them, he was extremely knowledgeable about them also, and they inspired him quite a lot in his compositional practice. He talked about things like crippled symmetry, the idea that in these rugs there would be an overall approximate symmetry of design, but it's not geometrical symmetry, it's not, it's not perfect symmetry. It's always a little bit off kilter. Why? Because it's done by hand. It's not perfect symmetry. And there's something of that in his music too. There's patterns that repeat, but they don't repeat identically. They're, they have a certain degree of uh, imprecision to them. And he's very skilled at calibrating that degree of imprecision quite precisely. I heard a story, actually, the composer Gérard Pesson, P-E-S-S-O-N, told me this once about one of his pieces uh, where he was repeating the same thing multiple times and when one of the repeats it looks like there's a wrong note, there's something that's a little bit different, it's not clear why, it looks like it could easily be a mistake. And he's explaining to a student of his that In certain ancient cultures, when they make a vase or they make some kind of decorative piece of work, if there's a pattern in it, in certain cultures, they'll, there'll be one moment where the pattern is just slightly off. And that you need to do that because perfection is not of this world. 
And you have to acknowledge that in your work. You must not seek perfection. Perfection is a fool's errand. Rather, embrace the imperfectibility of things by occasionally throwing in the odd flaw into your own work. And so Feldman presents us with this very humanistic, flawed image. It's never geometrically perfect. And again, I keep coming back to Barnett Newman, but he does the same thing in his paintings. He, he would never, you know, get out a, a tape measure and exactly bisect the canvas into three parts or, or two or anything like that. Or it's, it's not a matter of precise proportions in that sense ever. He hand draws the, the zips, the vertical elements in his paintings. He, no matter how large the canvas is, it's, it's worked out by hand. This is page. 89 that's just begun. Um, so that's an important thing to remember, you know, that these are handmade creations. They're very much made by hand. They're not, not drawn with a ruler, they're drawn freehand. Something of that aesthetic in Feldman and all the composers I admire Oh, that's unexpected. Microtones. We're four minutes and six, four hours and six minutes into the piece and throws in some microtones. <laughs> it's full of surprises. It's pretty. I haven't written a microtone in probably close to five years. Don't use them anymore, but they may return. Might get back to it. All of my pieces use microtones for years and years and then didn't need them anymore. It's funny. Only use what you need.
there's this ultra high harmonic D played on one of the violins, just completely alone, just suspended in this low chromatic cluster chord responding to it. It's this image of total solitude. It's quite effective and affecting. It's a, another new texture in the piece. You know, over four hours in, still finding new surprising things. Amazingly rich piece. It's funny, some people describe Feldman as being a kind of minimalist. It doesn't, it doesn't sound minimalist at all to me. It's a piece with actually quite a lot going on in it. Hmm. Interesting that the sonic plane is full. This is something I'm going to return to Barnett Newman again. He talked about the fact that the picture plane needed to be full, needed to be saturated. It didn't matter if there was hardly any paint on it, but you have to find a way to make the painting fee, uh, feel full somehow. It's the same with a piece of music. The sonic plane must be full. And if you can achieve that with two sounds, or if you need an entire orchestra playing thousands of notes in order for it to be full, then, you know, that's a stylistic consideration. But one should not have the feeling that it's not quite holding together. It has to be strong. It has to hold. Feldman does that always. His, his pieces never seem threadbare or like there's not enough material or it's not quite... You know, it's not quite cohering. There's always enough. The, the sonic plane is always full. Admirable that. Mm, hard to do. I got that wrong actually quite a lot in my early days when I was starting a lot of my early pieces. I needed to sort of fill out the, not fill it out, but there needed to be a bit more material or a bit more substance to the sound sometimes. Eventually got better at that, I think. You develop a sense for what a piece needs in order to hold together. That's experience.
expected Swiss tap water to taste a little better.
mean, the overriding impression of the piece is it's rather slow. There's, you know, very few sections that could be called fast, and they're short, and they're widely spaced. And most of the time, the piece just crawls along at this sort of breathing pace, but. But it is really hypnotic. Think about, you know, what, what a normal resting breathing pace would be for, you know, a reasonably healthy person. Something like this music. It's sort of tailored to that. I think that's why people find it so appealing. It's the way you breathe when you're really relaxed, you know. Maybe that's his secret. There's that suspended high harmonic D on the violin and the, followed by that dissonant chord. I've heard that before. Amazing how you just recognize these things instantly in the piece. They're so distinctive, so highly characterized, and so precisely voiced and instrumentated, if I can say it that way, that they're memorable and you recognize them instantly, even though it may have been an hour or more since you heard them last. Every sound in a piece has to have a character and a story that it's telling, I believe. You can't have anything be anonymous or interchangeable in a piece of music. It's all got to be just tailor fit for purpose. You know, an average or a mediocre piece, or indeed a bad piece, you know, you can tell right away the materials are sort of third hand, they're not distinctive, they're effectively interchangeable. You know, you could 
substitute them with something else and it would be just as fine. And this is a well-made piece. Just a touch of drama would be, a little bit more drama would be welcome. He could have gone a little bit farther in that direction at times, I think. Anyway, it is what it is. Sometimes I can't tell if it's a microtonal chord or if it's just the viola playing. <laughs> Sorry. I won't do viola jokes. Forget it. Someone inadvertently referred to me the other day as a musicologist, and I was a little bit... I have nothing against musicologists, not at all, but I'm not one, and it's funny. It always kind of bothers me when I'm called a musicologist. Apologies to any musicologists who might be watching this. I, I think it's a noble profession. It's just not what I do. And I don't know why people think I am one. I'm a, just a composer, and any composer would reflect on the history and materials of music. You might not do it publicly, but I'm still just a composer, not a musicologist. Anyway, it's about, about an hour left on the piece and 
it actually feels like it's starting to wind down. I don't imagine there'll be any new materials that are going to radically reconfigure the landscape of the piece at this point. Actually, I have heard this piece previously. I, I heard it, uh, I think, all the way through about 20 years ago when I first bought this CD. I didn't listen to it, I don't think, all in one go, but I have heard the whole thing. And I remember some features of it. I seem to recall a very extended and drawn out sort of concluding section. The piece actually does have a, a feeling of drawing to a, to a close at, at, at some point. It's, it's not just this open-ended thing that could go on forever, although that's what it seemed like in the first couple of hours that I was listening. No, it does have a shape to it. It does feel like we're settling in for like about an hour long cadential section of the piece. It'd be interesting to see if that's what happens.
Finally, a low note on the cello. It only took him four and a half hours. <laughs> I knew he'd get to it. That was exciting. Oh, this is most unexpected. Now there's a bit of a fast passage, sort of in these uh, sort of syncopated rhythms. It sounds like he's using microtones here. Oh, the piece is full of surprises. Pages 99 to 100, okay, I'm getting there. What are we at? Four hours and 44 minutes, wow.
That is really beautiful. There's this little three note motif that we keep hearing in the last section. Dum, dum, dum. It's just lovely. Uh, the way it's harmonized is really exquisite too. Um, and it's just the thing to round off the piece. I say round it off, there's still, there's still about 40 minutes or so to go, but it has a conclusive feel. I guess you need a huge conclusion to a huge piece, don't you? You can't just stop. Which is 101 to 104. Okay, I did actually hear that there was an edit there in the recording. There would have to be. I don't imagine that they made this recording in one single take. It's beautifully edited, but you can just slightly tell there's been a cut.
I've made it to five hours. Why don't you congratulate me? You can be creative about how you do that. At times it was feeling very difficult to have any sense of the landscape of this piece, of its architecture. But I'm starting to get a sense of it now. It does sort of have an expository section, a very extended slow section, and a kind of, kind of concluding section. That you can break it down into, into phases, if you like, even though it is obviously extremely long. But this piece has a shape to it. It's not some shapeless, formless thing, you know. It is still a composition, very much so. And just do keep thinking that a tiny bit more contrast wouldn't have killed him. water I have left. Beautiful. So la, it's just these two tones played on different instruments. Ah, that was really... He just has a sense of the exquisite. You know, if you appreciate that kind of thing, it's just... Uh, it's really... It's really very good. Oh. 
I love this. I just love it. It's so beautiful.
think the piece is even longer than I realized. Oh well, what does an extra 10 or 20 minutes make? Not much of a difference.
At this point, I've pretty much run out of things to say about the piece. I'm just... I'm listening. Maybe I'm getting a bit tired. It's possible. A little bit hungry. But... Maybe I'm in energy conservation mode. But it's been... What's it been? Five hours? 24 minutes? It's just about over. I'm really close to the end. So going into this, I wasn't sure if I could do it, and well, but I was determined to see it through to the end. Almost there. A little more water. It's February 1st, by the way. February is not a month I'm particularly fond of because it's basically the same as January, except that you're not all energized from the Christmas holidays. It does have the saving grace of being a little bit shorter than January. It's in March that things get really interesting. February is, I don't know, a month to work stay home. Or to, I don't know, 
travel to Switzerland and sit in a hotel room and listen to Morton Feldman for six hours. Take your pick.
I come to a low C on the cello. A good composer, though, always keeps something in reserve. You don't sort of reveal everything in the first page of the piece. You've got to keep something sort of stowed away for a special moment in the piece, and Feldman does that here. Even though the pace of the piece gets slower, and the rate of change gets much slower, there's more repetition, there are still surprises right up to the end. There's that same motif again. It's not really a motif, that cell, that four note cell. Amazing how many different shapes he can turn that into. Really, really impressive actually. It's a subtle piece. It, it, it's amazingly subtle. You wouldn't think a six hour long string quartet would be subtle, but it is. And uh, it's quite masterful. You can tell this is a late piece. It's fascinating, this section, this little pizzicato section with those four semitones constantly permutating it. It's the same rhythm. <laughs> the pitches don't quite repeat. You think it's going to and it doesn't quite. It keeps rearranging itself before your eyes. How many ways can you permutate four tones? <laughs> It's not clear what this is. It's not really a melody. It's not really an ostinato because it doesn't really repeat. It's not, what is it? I don't know. We're getting pretty close to the end now.
I've obviously been listening to the piece at a very low dynamic level throughout, which is a lot less fatiguing, better for your ears, and the music sounds just as good, if not better, at a low dynamic level anyway. It'd be kind of strange to take a piece like this and crank up the volume. This piece is really just like a dinner guest who comes over and stays and stays and stays and stays and stays. A very intelligent dinner guest. Intelligent and admirable, but nevertheless staying for a long time. You see, I've got to time this water so that there's just enough to last for the six hours of the piece to yours.
I mean, I, I really admire the piece and I'm enjoying it, but I'm starting to understand what the painter Philip Guston said when he moved away from abstract expressionism to his figurative style. He said he just got sick of all that purity. <laughs> Yeah, after I'm done with this, I think that'll be enough purity for now. Beautiful though it is. I'll be happy to listen to something else tomorrow. And moreover, actually, I'd be happy to get back to my own writing. I'm writing these piano pieces right now that are basically the polar opposite of Feldman in every respect. So it'd be nice to get back to them. more minutes left. How about that? I think I'll get a 400 gram steak. Maybe 500 grams. There's that three note motif. Ah, dum, bum. Again, it's feeling very conclusive. I've been saying that for an hour, haven't I? Still not quite done. Mm. It's close though.
just a couple more minutes. Uh, and by the way, I'm not going to have a conclusion, like, <clears throat> I'm too tired. Uh, I've said quite a lot about the piece, about Feldman, my thoughts about the music. I have no conclusion. don't exactly know what I think of this piece. I, I love it, I enjoy listening to it. I don't think it's Feldman's greatest work, incidentally. I think there are pieces that are uh, more consistent, perhaps, in a way or more satisfying, ultimately, but this is a unique work in every respect. A very interesting one. It's unrepeatable. It's an unrepeatable performance. Nobody's going to write this piece again, nor should they. And I think it's worth listening to once. Maybe twice. But once is probably going to be enough for most people. And you'll carry the memory of this piece with you. Definitely. It's a memorable piece. And, uh... Well, that's it then. I made it. I made it. So... Thank you for watching. next video will be very short.